Okay, good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the class, uh, BC205. Yeah, yeah. Um, keys to supernatural ministry. We're going to get started. I have uh, just turned on the uh, recording, so this lecture will be recorded and we will make it available uh, to others and to those who want to watch. Um, very good. Let's just have a word, word of prayer together, then we will uh, get started. Shri Kumar, would you like to pray with us, please? And we get started. Yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Right. Yeah. Father, we thank you, praise you, honor you for this wonderful morning what you have given to us. We surrender ourselves, O Lord, before you. We pray that, Father God, that your spirit of wisdom and spirit of understanding, O Lord, Master, enlighten us once again, O Father, so that we can grasp every revelation, and Lord, Master, so that we can be edified and be rooted in your word, O Father God, so that we can be a strong testimony and a witness for Jesus, O Lord, Master, so that we can be a productive weapon and a vessel for your kingdom and for the body of Christ, O God. Father, we surrender our heart, our mind, our soul, and our body. We surrender every every single person of God who is in this call. And we pray that, Father, prepare their heart, prepare their mind. We bind every spirit of distraction. We bind every spirit of darkness, which is trying to disturb and distract them, O oh, Father God. We pray, Father God, let your Holy Spirit take, take control of everything. And Lord, Master, let your grace overshadow on each one of us. So that, Lord, Master, every single word what we are going to hear, O oh God, let it edify us so that, Lord, Master, so that your church can be built up to us, O oh God, so that the kingdom of God be established through us. We give you all the glory, honor, and praises, O oh God, that these were deeply rooted in our heart and in our spirit, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone, once again, and thank you for connecting to this class. So we are... Uh, in this course, we're talking about keys to supernatural ministry. And last week was just a general, uh, uh, you know, welcome and just an open discussion. We didn't uh, actually get into the content, but we will start today. So, like we mentioned uh, in uh, last week, uh, in this course, uh, we are putting together things that uh, many of us have already learned. Uh, you know, most of us uh, would be aware of these things because you may have heard it in um, the earlier courses or you heard the preaching and the teaching. And so we are familiar with these truths. But uh, our, our goal is to learn how to put them together in our lives in practical ways and then how to live it out, how to exercise this. What are the keys that will enable us to experience the supernatural? Um, and, and that's our goal. Our goal is, okay, you know, I, I know certain truths, but how do I bring it together in practical situations uh, so that we can experience the supernatural, right? So the way we have divided this course uh, is in uh, four sections. As I mentioned last week, uh, we this the introductory session, which we'll get started today, has to more to do with just to just reaffirm some of the things we know that it is possible for every believer to be used by God uh, to manifest the supernatural. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because uh, uh, I think all of us are pretty convinced that uh, God will work through all of us. So I I'm just going to remind us of certain truths, so not too much time on it. But the next section, which is where we're going to spend most of our time, are just talking about these keys. Uh, the different things and how do they work together, you know, uh, in, in causing the supernatural to take place. Um, there is no formula. You know, I wish uh, we could get everybody a formula saying A plus B plus C is equal to a miracle. You know, and all of us can use it, A, B, and C. But it's not as simple as that. I mean, uh, there's more than A, B, and C. Uh, there are many keys God has given to us. And in different situations, God will use... Uh, different combinations of these to cause a miracle, you know. 
Uh, and so you'll have all kinds of things. You'll have, sometimes it's just a simple prayer and a miracle happens. Sometimes you lay hands, a miracle happens. Sometimes you don't lay hands and a miracle happens. You know, so it's, it's, just, it's just different. God uses, and, you know, uh, it uses these things in a variety of ways. And so uh, our goal is to understand you know, all the keys that are available and you know, basically learn to be led by the Holy Spirit in, in, in engaging these keys. Uh, the different truth is given us in order to see a miracle happen, uh, whether it's for our personal lives uh, and, and more importantly, when we're ministering to people because we want to see God do something for them to help them, to deliver them, to change the situations, right? So that's our goal. Uh, God, you know, work miracle in people's lives so they can be helped and things can happen for them. So learning how to work these keys. Then we talk a little bit about uh, personal preparation in the third section is what can I do to position myself to be an instrument that God will use. Uh, and then lastly, in the fourth section, we just talk about pursuit. That means, you know, look, we are making this journey. Uh, we should continue in this journey. Don't give up. Don't quit. And uh, we continue in our pursuit of the supernatural because the church is making a journey. We are going from glory to glory. If we were already at the final level of glory, then there is no need to go from glory to glory, right? So we are not there yet. God is taking us there. And so we have to, with endurance, keep making this journey as God takes the church from glory to glory. So that's the last section where we just encourage us to keep on the journey and don't give up, okay? So uh, feel free, uh, as always, to ask questions, to, you know, um, bring up things that you want uh, clarity on and we can discuss that. So today, uh, the goal is uh, uh, rather simple, uh, which is to uh, establish for us the fact that, you know, uh, uh, the possibility of a supernatural life in ministry for all of us, you know, on what basis can we say that, you know, uh, uh, as we talk about supernatural life in ministry, uh, last week, we just tried to have a little discussion on some of the objections that we face. And one of the objections, the common objections that we, that at least I have faced here, is that, hey, you know, uh, even the people outside the church uh, do supernatural things, you know, uh, meaning there are these fortune tellers and soothsayers and people who practice black magic and uh, others, they also do it. So they do it. That means we are, you know, so, and this is coming from church people. You know, I, I sometimes I receive calls, I received emails from people saying, Hey, why are you, you know, you, you, you're talking about the supernatural and, you know, we, uh, we used to run weekend schools. Uh, we stopped it now for last year and this year, but uh, we used to run weekend schools where we are just sharing with our own congregation people on various aspects of supernatural, whether it's prophetic or gifts or spirit and so on. And so uh, sometimes people in the city would, outside church people, but from not from our church, but from other churches <laughs> would, uh, you know, we love them. I have nothing against them. But, you know, I received emails. I received phone calls from people who, um, are they just saying, why are you doing this? Why are you running a weekend school on uh, gifts of the spirit? Or, you know, they, they challenge that. And, uh, and, and, and common reason is even the unbelievers do supernatural things. Well, look at Jesus. He faced the same accusation, you know. And they said, oh, Jesus is doing it by Bill Zebub. Face the same thing. And then Jesus said, look, if you're telling me I'm doing it by Beelzebub, then by whom are your children doing it? Meaning, you know, you, you look at your, your own people. They're also doing the miraculous thing. Oh, where is their source of power? You know? So you, either, you have to distinguish what comes from God and what comes from the devil. Yes, we know the devil works miracles, but not every miracle is Beelzebub. Beelzebub does some, but God does much better much greater, right? So you can't just classify every miracle as a one from the devil. And, and one of my responses would be, look, there are counterfeit notes, but you don't throw away the original just because there is counterfeit. The fact that there is counterfeit 
only goes to say that the original is very valuable. That's why they're copying it, you know? So the only way, the best way to deal with counterfeit is to be very good with the original, to know the original. So then you go for the original. The, the solution is not to throw away the original, right? Go with the original, but get to know it very well. And that's why you know, we must be so firmly founded in this truth that the supernatural is for us today. It is for every believer. God wants to work through every believer supernaturally, no questions asked, and be so established in that truth. So when people question it or challenge it, it will not shake you. You just keep doing what you're called to do, right? So why do we say that the supernatural is a possibility for every believer? We look at just four simple things, and these are familiar things. I'm just, you know, like I said, we're just reminding you, getting this established and we will move forward. First of all, the Lord Jesus himself has invited every believer into this ministry. He's invited every believer. And you can see the progression, you know. So when Jesus came and he started his earthly ministry, uh, he went about preaching and he went about teaching. And then he also went about healing delivering and working miracles. So he healed the sick, he cast out demons, and he worked miracles to meet the needs of the people. In those days, it was uh, multiplying uh, five loaves and two fish, calming the storm, uh, uh, those kinds of miracles. He did those, but he did miracles. And, you know, Jesus could have, could have, and many of us would have expected that, you know, he'll just do the ministry very powerfully and he'll go. But that's not it. He was doing the ministry and then he turned around to his 12 disciples and said, I want you to start doing the same thing. And we are familiar with Matthew chapter 10. Let's read the scriptures. I mean, I know uh, many of us are familiar with these scriptures, but I think it's just good to read them again. Uh, Matthew 10, let's read verse 1, then verse 7 and 8, please. Somebody could read it for us. Um, we can move fast on this, right? Matthew 10, Sir, verse 1. Go ahead, please. Uh, Matthew 10, 1. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. 7 and 8. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, very interesting. He's extending the same ministry to his 12 disciples. So he didn't say, look, you know, I am the son of God and uh, I am the Messiah and only I'm here to do this. All of you watch me. He didn't do that. He called his 12 disciples and said, look, I'm giving you authority. I'm giving you the same authority. You go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Heal all manner of sickness and disease. I'm giving it to you. Right? And then he didn't stop with just the 12. Now, some people say, well, he needed 12 more people to help him, you know, to get the message across faster. In those days, they didn't have internet. They didn't have, you know, all these things. So he had to appoint 12 more people to do the work. Okay, maybe, maybe that's a good reason. But then he didn't stop with that. You go to Luke 10. Let's read what happened in Luke 10. Luke chapter 10. Somebody could read those verses, please. Luke 10, uh, 10 chapter, verse 1. Uh, after this, this things, uh, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent by uh, them two by two uh, before his face uh, into every city and place. Uh, every himself 
host abort go mm -hmm. and uh, 17 to 19 uh, then uh, the 70 returned with joy lord even uh, even we um they went as uh, subject subject uh, to our use yeah, your uh, name and uh, we said satan is he said uh, he said to them i saw satan falling light lighting to fall from heaven amen okay thank you Dinesh. so uh what what do we see in luke 10 he's appointing another 70. so you didn't stop with 12. he picked out another 70. and uh you know and he said to the 70 go to the same thing you whatever wherever you go you heal the sick and do the same things and so you know uh, that was in verse 9 and they come back in verse 17 they say lord the demons are subject to us in your name and to the 70 he says you know i'm giving you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy so he extended to 70 then you know uh, as always uh, we christians are very good in arguing so they will say well you know jesus was following moses example moses chose 12 spies but Moses also had 70 elders. So that's why Jesus had 12 disciples and he appointed another 70. That'll be the argument. Okay, fine, if you're arguing like that. Well, two things. Let's go to Mark 9. What do we see happen in Mark 9? Here is an unnamed person, Mark chapter 9. And verse 38 to 40. Somebody could read that, please. Now, now, John. John, now John answered him, saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name. And we forbid him because he does not follow us. But Jesus said, Do not forbid him. For no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. Mm. So there goes the theory that Jesus was following Moses' example. Moses had 12 spies, 70 elders. Okay, so Jesus appointed 12 apostles and other 70. But here's the 71st person. Mark chapter 9. There is an unnamed person. Unnamed. We don't even know his name. And he is not... Um, all right, we can mute the mic. Uh, somebody's mic is on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, he's not part of the 12. He's not part of the 70. And he was not even officially commissioned by Jesus. So the 10 were officially commissioned. They're official representatives. The 70 were officially commissioned. So they're official representatives. Here is an unofficial man, meaning he wasn't commissioned directly by Jesus. So I'm just imagining, okay, I'm just imagining this man must have been in that crowd, standing around Jesus. And, uh, you know, Jesus called the 70 people and he said, okay, 70, uh, you know, I, I'm pointing all of you. I want you to go into every city uh, where you know I would like to go. Go to all these cities, and I want you to go and heal the sick, and I want you to cast out demons. I want to do this. So here's this man in the crowd saying, "Hey, I'm not in the seventy, but I heard what Jesus told them. He told them to use his name, so I'm going to use it." And so he goes out. He's not part of the twelve. He's not part of the seventy, but he goes out. And he uses the name of Jesus. And he's casting out demons and he's working miracles. So the news goes back to the disciples. And the disciples say, hey, he's not one of the 12. He's not one of the 70 unofficial. Let's report it to Jesus. And they reported to Jesus, John. Now this is John. He's like the beloved. 
the closest to Jesus other than Peter and James. He comes. He says, Lord, I got a I got a incidental report. There's an unofficial man. He's using your name. He's casting out demons. He's doing all these things. And then Jesus says, Do not forbid him. Okay. That means Jesus is not against people who believe in him using his name. They're not part of the 12, they're not part of the 70, but this man believes in Jesus, he's using his name. And so Jesus, do not forbid him, don't stop him. No one who, who can you know, work a miracle in my name is gonna speak against me. So we see right here in the gospels, He's setting a pattern. He's saying, look, if you believe in me, you can use my name. You don't have to be one of those 12 apostles, and none of us are. You don't have to be one of the 70. None of us are. But here we are today, 2,000 years later, we believe in Jesus. We can use his name and work miracles in his name. And to add to this, we go to Matthew 28, uh, which is the great commission, which uh, many of us know, sorry, uh, Matthew 28, uh, verses 18 to 20. Somebody could read that for us, please. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, you know, this is the Great Commission, which he's giving, of course, to uh, the apostles and the early disciples. And what is the commission? Go make disciples and do what? Verse 20. Teach them to observe. That means to do all that I have commanded you, which includes heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. That means through the Great Commission, the invitation of Jesus to do the works he did has been extended to every believer in our day and time. Because he said, tell them to observe or to do everything I've commanded you. And he did command the 12, he did command the 70 to do the works he did. So that invitation is extended to you and me today. No questions asked. Okay? Right there he has said, go make disciples of all nations, includes us from different parts of the world. Observe everything he had commanded the disciples. Do it. So that's the first reason why you and I believe that supernatural life and ministry is for us today. Right? Second reason, is what we have learned about sonship glory. That means the very glory that Jesus Christ walked in on this earth as the Son of God has been given to every believer. Right? The very glory that Jesus walked in as the Son of God has been given to every believer. The glory is the expression of God's nature. It is the expression of who God is and what he does. And that glory, which was expressed through Jesus, which Jesus walked in, which Jesus carried, and which Jesus demonstrated, has been given to every believer. Now, if we don't know it, that is not Jesus' fault. And if we don't walk in it, that is not Jesus' fault. But the fact is, the truth is, the glory has been given to every believer. So what are we talking about? We will look at these scriptures. Uh, let's go to John chapter 1, verse 14, and then John 2, verse 11. Somebody could read these verses for us, please. 
John 1, 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Chapter 2, verse 11, please. John 2, verse 11. 11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus said at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Thank you, sir. All right. So, verse 14 of John 1, it's saying, The Word, this is the eternal Word, became flesh, that is the Son of God, Jesus, became flesh, embodied came in human form, the Word, eternal Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And He carried the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, as a Son of the Father, as the only begotten of the Father. He carried what we refer to as Sonship glory. So He had eternal glory, which is the glory of the Deity. But in His, in, in his incarnation, he left the glory of the deity aside and he came in what we refer to as sonship glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So the glory is the substance of God. It is the expression of God's nature. And what happened to this glory that Jesus walked in, which he carried? It says, this glory was visible to us, was full of grace, full of truth, full of grace. We could see the virtues of God, full of truth. We could see the light of God, the purity. But not only was it full of grace and full of truth, John 2.11 says, the signs Jesus did, the signs, the, 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 this is the first sign, John chapter two, but all the signs he did revealed or manifested sonship glory. So sonship glory is revealed through the virtues of God, the grace of God. It's revealed through truth, through truth, which is the purity of God. And it's also revealed through the signs, which is the power of God, sonship glory. So he walked as a son of God in this aspect of the glory of God. Very interesting, when you go to John chapter 17, let's read verse 2, verse 5 and verse 22, please. John 17, verse 5 and 22. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. No. Thank you. So John 17, Jesus is praying. And verse 5, he says, Father, glorify me with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So Jesus on the earth, he's praying to the Father. He says, Father, please give me that glory that I had with you. That is the eternal glory, the glory of the deity. That means on the earth, at that moment, he had the glory as of the Son of God. He had what we call a sonship glory. But he's praying and saying, Father, please, restore or give back to me that eternal glory, the glory of the deity. So I want you to see the difference. On the earth, as the son of God, he was walking in sonship glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father. The sonship glory is revealed through grace, truth, and power. Grace, meaning the virtues of God. Truth, meaning the purity of God. Science, meaning the power of God. 
But Jesus, in his sonship glory, is praying in John 17, 5, and says, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you, which is the eternal glory, the glory of the deity. The glory, the eternal glory, the glory of the deity is expressed through omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence. So he's praying, God. And sure enough, then Jesus ascended and was after his death, burial, and resurrection, and he ascended to heaven. He received once again the eternal glory, omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. But on the earth, he was walking in sonship glory, grace, truth, and power. And that glory, verse 22, he says, Father, the glory which you have given me, I have given them, who? Believers, his followers. That means the sonship glory has been passed on, has been given to the followers or believers of Jesus Christ. So that's why we must understand the same glory Jesus walked in as the Son of God is in you. So how do you know that? Verse 22. The glory which you gave me, I have given them, each one, each one of his followers. He's praying that's he's praying for each one of us. So you have sonship glory. You have divine nature, you have the glory of God in you, which is the capacity to reveal who God is and what he does through virtue, grace, that is virtue, through truth, that is purity, integrity, and through science, which is power. So all these three aspects reveal or manifest sonship glory. So every believer has been given that. You know, and so that's why if you go to, uh, we'll just look at those scriptures from First John, First John chapter 2. Somebody could read that for us, First John 2. Uh, I will finish this and then we will take up questions, all right? So if you have questions, we can discuss them. I'll, I'll just finish this. And First John 2, somebody could read verse 6 and also we'll read chapter 4, verse 17, please. First John 2, verse 6, somebody. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Okay. 417. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Amen. Mm. Thank you. So, John is saying, if anyone says you abide in Jesus, you have to walk as he walked. Now that's a very big statement. Walk as Christ walked. How did he walk? Grace, truth, power. We have no right to say, well, you only have to walk in grace. Hmm? No, John didn't say that. He said, you have to walk as he walked, in grace, in truth, in power. Because that was sonship glory. He walked like that as a son of God. And First uh, John 4.17 is an amazing verse because it's saying, look, you know, we have confidence in the day of judgment. We are not afraid of judgment day because we have the love of God in our hearts. And not only that, right now, as he is, so are we on the earth. That means we are like Jesus in the earth. Now I know, you know, uh, the practical side is we are all becoming like Jesus. But as far as God is concerned, he says, look, that's, I've given it to you. I've given you the capacity to be like Jesus on the earth. And I know we all have our 
in our soul and our flesh to deal with. Uh, so that's why we are becoming like him. We are journeying into it. But as far as God is concerned, is look, I've given you the capacity so that as Christ is, same way you will be on earth. And so it is not wrong for any of us to desire to be like Jesus on the earth in all aspects, in grace, truth, and power. So that's sonship glory. The third in aspect, third reason why we say, and I'm moving through this fast. My goal is to you know finish this this section today. Sorry, and the next week we get into the keys uh, for supernatural ministry. Uh, these are things we are uh, most of us are familiar with already. Two more things. So first we saw the invitation of Jesus. Second, it's the sonship glory, the capacity God has given to each and every believer to be like Jesus, right? The third is the empowering of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who anointed Jesus is anointing you and me today. Same Holy Spirit. So we know that Jesus, as the Son of God, ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that. Luke 4, uh, 18 and 19, uh, Jesus said, you know, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to preach deliverance to the captives, liberty of sight to the blind, to heal the brokenhearted, and deliverance to those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He said, the Holy Spirit is on me for me to do all this. So everything he did, he did by the anointing, he did by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. He ascended to heaven. And then he said, the same Holy Spirit will come on you and you'll receive power. He did not indicate any change in either the person or the power. He didn't say, well, I had Holy Spirit, you will receive junior Holy Spirit or something else. He didn't say anything like that. There is no other Holy Spirit. There is only one Holy Spirit. And the same God who anointed Jesus anoints you and me. And there is no indication, no mention of any reduction in power. He didn't say, you know, you will receive 50% power. No, he said, you will receive power. He was anointed with power. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So the power is available. Now, what we have to learn is how do we flow in it? How do we grow in it and so on. So we have a learning process because you know we have come out of darkness and we have come out of uh, all the things that we've gone through and we are now learning about the kingdom of God and learning about the, the keys of uh, how God works and so on. So it's a learning process for us. And so that's why it takes us time and, and, and we are learning from our mistakes. Uh, we are overcoming our ignorance and uh, you know we're journeying into this. But the point I want to emphasize is the same Holy Spirit and the same measure of power that went through Jesus is available for every believer. And the last one is the authority he vested in us, which means he gave us his name. So let's go to John 14. Again, it's a very familiar passage. We'll just read two verses. We will read or three verses. John 14, we'll read verse 12, 13, and 14. John 14, 12, 13, and 14. Please, somebody could read that. What? Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Mm, thank you. So in, in verse 12, he said, The works I do, 
whoever believes in me, the works I do, he will also do. And even greater works. So Jesus kept room for us to go beyond him. Now, there's a reason. Because many, and this is again another common objection, question that keeps, you know, people, I'm talking about church people, hit us with, oh, can you show me in the Bible where Jesus uh, prayed for, you know, somebody without whose organ had failed or whose organ has been taken away for that to be put back or where did Jesus pray for somebody's uh, uh, debts to be cancelled or whatever, you know, the different, different miracles that we need in our day and time. So people question those things. Uh, well, Jesus said, the works I do and the great uh, works, that means there is space for much more. Things that have not yet been recorded in the scriptures. Greater works. The works I do and greater works. If it's aligned to the character and nature of God, go ahead. Pray for it. Right? So the works I do and greater works. But how is that going to happen? 13 and 14. In my name. In my name, Jesus said. So by what we understand by giving us his name, he's giving us his authority. Means everything, everything that he is, is there in his name, is given to us, so go in my name. So that, that authority we must understand. When, when, when we say in Jesus' name, we are standing in his place, on his behalf, representing him to do everything he would do if he were present here physically. That's what we are saying and we say in Jesus' name. You're saying, I'm here, standing in the place of Jesus, standing on his behalf, representing him to do everything he would do if he was standing here physically right now. That's what you and I are saying when we say in Jesus' name. And that's the authority vested in us. He said, do the works I do and even greater. So don't hesitate to ask for things that are not recorded necessarily in the Gospels or anywhere in Scripture because the greater works, things that, that, that matter to our day and time, to people in our day and time, greater works. And uh, she's also mentioned in Matthew 16, he said, you know, I'm giving the church the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keys represent authority. It's the authority of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is vested in the church. Right? So to sum up, what the goal of this in introduction is this. On the basis of these four things, and, you know, we could, we could explore scripture and add to this list, but, I felt you know, these are major, major truths. One is the invitation of Jesus, which is so clear. Sonship glory, number two. Third, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And fourth, the authority vested in each and every believer is telling us we can do the works he did and greater works. So we must journey into it. Right? So we'll take up some questions, some discussions, and then we will wrap up. So we must be convinced. This is what, this is the possibility for us. Okay. So I, I see a question there. Why? can't believers demonstrate the same power as Lord Jesus did 2,000 years ago? So the answer to that, Abhishek, is, look, uh, first of all, we must know the truth. So much of the church, when I say church, I mean believers, we, us people, we don't know the truth, we don't know the possibility. So you will never walk in truth that you don't know. We don't know the truth. 
are, we don't embrace the truth. So even if we have heard it, we don't receive it. We don't press into it. So there's one important aspect of the kingdom of God Jesus taught us. He said the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. So this is, you know, the, the two sides to the kingdom. On the one hand, we receive it like a child. On the other hand, we pursue it like a warrior. And both are important. Most people like the child part. And I'll just sit and receive it. But Jesus also said, you have to pursue it like a warrior. You have to press into it. And that requires commitment. That requires some serious work from our side. Most people don't like to do that. So we can never possess the kingdom if you're not willing to pursue it. So that's another reason why the church doesn't. Not too many people are willing to pursue the truth. Right? So, but, and the third part is that we are progressing into it. You know, we are learning, we are understanding, uh, we are pressing into it. And the, the more we be journeying into it, the more miracles we will see. And Paul the Apostle said in Ephesians 5, right? Jesus is coming back for a glorious church. That means I believe the church will come to this place of where it is called, where it is, where it is the glorious church, meaning a church that is truly manifesting the glory of God. He's coming back for that church. And we are very close to it. Why? Because all over the world, people are proclaiming this truth, proclaiming truth. And, you know, first, the way God works is first truth is proclaimed. Then the church rises into the truth that we proclaim. Because unless the truth is proclaimed, the church never graduates. It never goes up. Right? So we have to keep proclaiming, keep proclaiming, keep proclaiming the truth. And the church will slowly rise up to that truth, right? So sooner than later, the church will be walking in this truth. Church means every believer will be walking in this truth, but we have to keep proclaiming it. This is what the Bible says. This is the truth we're going to pursue. And then soon the church will start walking in it. So we will see it. And, you know, we are beginning, we are seeing things uh, that, that, that are, the works of God being manifested. Okay, good. Any other question? Okay. So the next one here, question is, the sonship glory that Jesus has given us is manifested in grace, truth, power. Please provide more details with examples. So, so grace uh, talks about the virtues of God in this context. The word grace is in the New Testament is used in different contexts, right? So the context will determine uh, what the meaning is, how we should understand the word. There's the same word grace, charis, but the context determines the meaning, right? So uh, in, in this full of grace, full of virtue, meaning godly character, right? So when we walk in godly character we are displaying the glory of god so when people hate you you love them you're displaying the glory of god when you are generous to people you're displaying the glory of god uh, when uh, in, in, in a situation in a situation of great turmoil you're walking in peace you're demonstrating the glory of god that's grace truth has to do with integrity with light with holiness with purity so in things that are very corrupt around you, you're walking in holiness. You're manifesting the glory of God because holiness is an aspect of God's virtue. When you, when we, you know, we refuse to do any things that are wrong, things that are displeasing to God, we are manifesting the glory of God in that situation, right? And power is what this course is about. It is about demonstrating the healings, the miracles, the deliverances, uh, things in people's lives, you know, and 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 God works powerful things, you know, uh, and uh, He works in 
powerful ways in order to minister to people, to minister into their life situations. Um, whether it's healing, whether it's deliverance in their family situation, uh, whether it is financial miracles, provision coming in, we are manifesting the power of God in our day, in our time, in our context. Right? So I hope that helps. Christopher. Okay. Dinesh, you have a question or you are? Yeah, uh, Pastor. Uh, uh, and uh, Noah's race, uh, uh, Paul's focus are coming in the name of uh, Jesus. Mm. Uh, how can um, we can believe, we can trust our, our uh, unsaved people and save souls can uh, differentiate uh, uh, yeah, my friend raised a question I mm -hmm. was uh, not able to answer and mm -hmm. help me help me sure sure so this whole question about false prophets uh, people who Two things. So we have to, you know, I'll, I'll make a few comments. Uh, first is we have to differentiate between bad prophets and false prophets. And I'm using the word bad just, just as a tag. And I said, what do I mean by bad prophets? Meaning they are genuine ministers of God, just that maybe they may not behave or they may make some mistakes or, you know, things like that. So they, you know, I just, they're not false, they're genuine, but they may, you know, intentionally, maybe un un unintentionally do some mistakes, you know. So we shouldn't call them as false prophets, that just that they are still in a, in a stage of growth, development or learning, understanding that they make mistakes along the way. So that's why I just quote unquote, call them bad. That means they, they made some mistakes. They're not false. Uh, they made mistakes. But then there are false. False means they are not true. And they are only using uh, the church or the opportunity uh, to, you know, mislead people, to hurt people. Um, so how, what are some of the tests the Bible is giving us? And uh, I'll just quickly mention this. You know, in Matthew 7, Jesus says, you will know them by their fruit. And so we look for what is the actual outcome. Look for the fruit. Uh, don't look at just the performance or the ministry that you see. What is the fruit? I mean, what is the long-term impact on the lives of people? That's fruit. Okay. The ministry what they do, that is the expression of, you know, uh, the work, what they're doing. But the fruit is how are people's lives changed for the long term? So Jesus said, by the fruit, you will know them. Secondly, Jesus said, they will do the will of the Father. Again, this is all in Matthew 7, okay? They will, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, but he who does the will of my Father. So that's the thing. Is the will of God being done? So the will of God is it's all of the word of God. Is all of the word of God being done? Are they walking in all of the scripture? You know, walking in holiness, walking in humility, uh, walking in you know, all of the scriptures. Is the will of God being done? So that's the second thing. Third is, are they in a relationship with Jesus? Because he said there in Matthew 7, I never knew you. So a false prophet does not have a personal connection with Jesus. They may use things around him, but they don't know him. They're not in that personal connect. And all these three things are in Matthew 7 itself. Like, so we, ex we, ex we look at these three things. Uh, the first, what is their fruit? Second, is the will of God being executed or followed? Third, are they speaking from a personal relationship with Jesus? Are they glorifying Jesus? Are they exalting Jesus? Are they pointing people to Christ, right? Uh, if this doesn't happen, then you question what is being done. 
right? But I want to just say one thing here. Don't judge any preacher by one sermon. And that's being very unfair, right? You don't read one page in a book and judge the whole book. Or like we normally say, don't judge a book by its cover. So don't judge a book by one page that you read. If you want to really judge the book, read all the pages. If you want to really judge a preacher, listen to, look at his ministry, listen to, you know, a substantial amount of what he teaches and preaches before passing judgment, you know, because even it happens to me all the time, you know, somebody hears one message I preach and then they send me some harsh email. I'm like, oh, you know, I don't let these things bother me, but I'm just saying, you know, this is so unfair. You know, uh, there are, you know, there are sermons, for 20 years worth of sermons out there on our website. You know, judge me based on those 20 years of sermons, not just one sermon. You know, so because they, people may not understand the context in which that sermon is being preached. You know, and so it's so easy to misjudge. So look at Take a, you know, a comprehensive look before passing judgment, okay? All right, I hope that helps. I know I've already gone over time. Uh, and uh, Charles, I, you, I know you have a question here, but I don't want to hold up the whole class. Uh, is it a question that we can ask, handle next week, Charles? Or, or uh, I. I think we maybe you can handle it next week, but it was a short one referring to the, the, the book of First John. As he, so, we are uh, mm -hmm. looking at the, pre, the, the present continuous tense. As he is, so we are. And people mm -hmm. are saying that because he is a spirit, then we are spirits. Because he is God, then we are gods. And the, we are not affected by sin. Uh, it, it's it's really disturbing my mind mm. to see that people are misbehaving because of that scripture. As mm. it is, so we are. It is disturbing me a lot. I wanted more, more, more explanation because there are some youths that I meet mm. and they tell you that. And the, you find, especially university students, that end up aborting because they even if they they have uh, premarital sex even if they do and they still they cannot sin because they are jesus so <laughs> things mm, like that yeah Charles. so like how we learned in our course on interpreting scripture right our immediate response is all scripture must be interpreted in the light of scripture Right. So what else did John write in that whole book? Right. What's he writing to believers? He's telling, he's teaching us. Right? You read chapter one all the way to the end of chapter five. He's teaching us believers that we shouldn't live in sin. Right. Uh, we shouldn't walk in hate. We should walk in love. So there's so much more he's teaching. And in the middle of all that, he's telling us that we have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we. Uh, but it doesn't, he's not excluding the fact that as believers, we must purify ourselves. You know, First John 3, 1 and 2, he says, everyone who has to so purifies himself. So we have to do that. We have to purify ourselves. So there is, you know, so basically the answer is very simple. Every scripture has to be interpreted and understood and applied in the light of the rest of scripture. What does the rest of scripture teach us? It teaches us to live holy lives, right? So it is true. We are called to walk as Christ walked, but he sanctifies us. We live holy lives. We live sanctified lives, you know, so the rest of scripture has to be followed. Okay. All right. So let's wrap up here. I've taken 10 more, 10 extra minutes today. Uh, we're going to close in prayer. We'll dismiss and we'll meet again next week. We'll take things forward. Okay, so next week we get into the second section, which is the keys for supernatural ministry. Could somebody please close in prayer and we will dismiss. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for such a sweet fellowship we have as we continue to sit at your feet to learn your word, that we would be able to understand your word and be able to live a life that pleases you. For when you say it, that when your word is, my word is in you and you are in me, 
we shall do great exploits. Therefore, Lord, continue to teach us through our pastor and our teacher that in all, you who is our great teacher will be able to understand and be able to apply the life principles and the spiritual principles and the biblical principles in our lives, in our families, and in our ministry. That as we depart, Lord, continue to bless us till we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being on the class today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, we'll meet again.